uh, the, try to do Big Bang nucleosynthesis in the cosmic microwave background in one fell swoop. Uh, so, um, and uh, and so, since the discovery of the idea of these two things is both due to one uh, one not well, not sufficiently well known person, uh, George Gamow, uh, it's worth 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 saying a word about him. So. We're, we're in an institute which greatly glorifies uh, formal sort of mathematical uh, t theoretical physics. Uh, Gamov is just worth considering as another model of what you, what you might be. He, uh, uh, he was sort of the master of, uh, in the 30s and 40s, the master of sort of the, uh, first of all, noticing when there was a very interesting unexplained phenomenon uh, and then producing the first sort of quick and dirty, often back of the envelope uh, explanation of what was going on. He was, he was, he, uh, uh, so so when, the, when the terrain was very unclear, George Gamow could still use the back of an envelope uh, to a, amazing effect. And so that's, that's one of the things that we'd like to glimpse today. But just to say, so for example, you know, it was discovered in the 30s, well, basically people began to, uh, uh, nuclei uh, fissioned uh, uh, and, the, and, uh, and Gamov uh, and people were exploring the properties of, of uh, atomic nuclei. And Gamov uh, is the originator of the liquid drop model, which is sort of this, I mean, it seems like magic in retrospect that it works, but uh, it, was, it was really the first, uh, you know, in the days before quantum field theory, he somehow managed to uh, obtain what was for a time the well, it was the first quantitatively successful model of what was going on in nuclei, what, how to explain the quantitative properties of the various nuclei in the periodic table and their various isotopes and the rates at which certain reactions went and why certain guys fissioned and with what, what rates. Um, also, shortly after DNA, shortly after it was realized that DNA was the, was the, was the sort of carrier of the uh, genetic material, of the genetic code, uh, there was a question of what you know. What is the genetic code? I mean, what you know? Somehow, people people it, it had been determined that uh, by, by by Watson and Crick that that uh, there was this molecule. It had some structure, and uh, somehow it was you know it was basically two long strings of uh, molecules which came in four categories. You know, four four different letters, uh, and uh, Somehow, those strings were encoding, were telling the cell how to produce all the different proteins, which themselves were strings of, you know, 22 amino acids. And uh, uh, so, yeah, again, Gamow produced the, uh, the first model that was sort of on the right track. A typical thing he would do is kind of produce the first breakthrough model that was on the right track. Typically, it would also have highly crazy elements that turned out to be wrong. So, so, uh, but that's still that's beside the point. The point is he he you know, Gamov again and again gets the basically basically shows the path, and uh, in particular he's I, I I hear supposedly he is he is responsible for this now famous argument about that ultimately led to the correct answer about the genetic code, which is just that okay there's 22 amino acids there's only four letters in the, in, in DNA. You know, so if you had only, if uh, if you have a string of those letters and and you try to have each letter code for an amino acid, you're you're in trouble because there's only four of them, so you can't code for 22 different things. If you take two, then a, a two two a two-letter word built from an alphabet of four letters can code for 16 different amino acids. Again, not enough. So three is the three will get you up to uh, 64. So he said, okay, that's you know that's 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 the simplest logical possibility. So that's probably it, uh, and that and that that was right. I mean, I mean, in other words, that is correct. That 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 every 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 triplet of uh, of, of uh, codons, every, every every triplet of uh, bases in, in DNA is a codon that codes for one of the amino acids in the in the protein that this string codes that this gene codes for. Uh, so that's awesome. 
And then the thing we'll talk about today are he made sort of the two uh, primordial d discoveries about the uh, uh, about the Big Bang model. Uh, the idea that the that that you could uh, on the back of an envelope uh, confirm for yourself that the light elements in the periodic table and their cosmic abundances were probably produced in the Big Bang, not in stars. Okay, so Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, and, and then he also realized that there should be a bath of photons, or ba bath of cosmic radiation streaming through the uh, uh, cosmos. And he, he originally, back the earliest estimate, he, he estimated it at, at 50 Kelvin, and then he brought that estimate down below 10 Kelvin to something like 5 Kelvin. And the observed radiation is 3 Kelvin. Um, and yeah, so this is, uh, this, th th these two things were really, did not get the attention they deserve for decades, but these are, you know, really monumental discoveries in, in 20th century science. Well, I mean, all of these things, these are all, these are all huge topics, uh, important discoveries in, in uh, 20th century science. So, what am I trying to say? Be like this guy. You know, be like, be like Ed Witten too, but also be a little bit like this guy. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so I just wanted to, I wanted to uh, sketch uh, the, uh, these two topics as, as Gamov would have, would have described them on the back of an envelope. Now, again, as I say, there will be considerable airbrushing of history because I only want to pass along to you what was correct about, about, uh, about what, uh, about Gamow's line of thought. But anyway, so let's, uh, let's, let's dive in and I'll do them maybe both at about the same level of depth so that if David convinces me afterwards, then the two, the quest, the basic question is, I, uh, I was going to do one of these guys in a little bit more depth and then leave the other one to, to do in the tutorial. Uh, David suggests we do this one in the tutorial and do this one in a little bit more depth. I'm going to do them both in about the same depth in the lecture so that we, so that we can leave the decision till after class uh, about, about which one to actually uh, do in the tutorial. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's just start by... Um, Let's just start by, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the basic puzzle? Uh, so you look out into the universe with telescopes and you see that with, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, the abundance of, so here's the periodic table, okay, as I understand it. It's something, it looks like this. There's something more or less like that maybe. And then kind of, I don't really know. It has, you know, it has something, some shape like that. I'm not a chemist. It's, there's a periodic table and it has, different, all the different atoms we've, we can make. It doesn't have that many columns either. Anyway, and then there's a couple little things down here that are like sort of insets. Um, so there are some cosmic abundances of these various, various elements. Uh, you know, you, you know, carbon and, and oxygen and uh, calcium, various, uh, various things are very important for you. And they're rather abundant here on Earth. Uh, but the first thing to say is that in the universe at large, they're pathetically unabundant. So the universe at large, 75% uh, of the mass, that is, if we focus on the, on the mass in the universe, which is made out of atoms of the periodic table, let's forget about dark matter and dark energy for a moment. If we focus on the ordinary stuff, the so-called baryons in the universe, by mass, 75% of that is hydrogen, first element. See, that, that's one of the ones where I know where it is in the periodic table. And then the second one is helium. And already there, I'm already getting confused about where it is. But I believe helium is over here. Uh, so the remaining 25% of the mass in the universe is in helium. And then everything else is just a little, tiny little seasoning. You know, you included. Uh, uh, and all the air you breathe, and all, all the other elements are uh, are, are extremely uh, sub-percent trace amounts of the cosmic mass budget. So anyway, what, what, where did this where did this story come from? I mean, why 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 
why do we have the elements we do in, in, in these abundances? Well, so as I, as I mentioned, Gamov was uh, present very early in the game uh, in, in understanding the, what we would now call the strong and weak forces that govern how nuclei behave. Uh, and one of the classic sort of middle of the century applications of that, one of the first uh, applications was a bunch of smart people figured out that that's, that, that, that that's how stars are shining. It used to be the, earlier, before people understood how the nucleus worked, it was thought that, well, uh, gr gravity caused the collapse of a ball of gas and, uh, and just the heat, the kinetic energy from that collapse heated it up a lot and heated it up so much that it had to radiate like crazy to, to, get, to get rid of all that excess heat. Um, so that, that, you know, that w it was figured out in the mid 20th century that that was wrong, that what's going on is that the middle of stars are nuclear reactors, they're fusion reactors, where the dominant reaction is that they're burning uh, hydrogen plus, they're, 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 the dominant reaction is that they're burning four hydrogens into helium. And that's, that's releasing, you know, this, uh, and, 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 and confined by the gravity of the star in the, in the intense pre pressure and uh, density and temperature at the center of the star, you can, you can get over the barrier, the, the Coulomb repulsion of these guys, and smash them close enough together that they can leap into this lower, lower energy configuration of four nucleons, which is thermodynamically preferable. And every time they do that, re they release a lot of energy. They release a couple of MeV worth of energy. Uh, so anyway, that's how stars burn. And, and then, you know, roughly speaking, stars burn hydrogen until they, they can't burn hydrogen anymore and they have a bunch of helium. Then they do something messy, but then eventually they, if they're heavy enough, they get down to burning that helium into heavier elements and so on and so on. And uh, so what these guys, primarily beta, but also, anyway, also, also other people, uh, and including Gamov, you know, figured out was that if that for most of the elements in the periodic table up to iron, so iron, you know, iron is the most tightly bound uh, element in the periodic table. In other words, it's ma the mass of iron divided by the number of protons plus neutrons in iron is the lowest for any element in the periodic table. So it's the most thermodynamically stable element. So, so at the so, so, and, 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 and so most of these elements in the periodic table up to iron, wherever iron is, element 59 maybe, and somewhere in the middle of the periodic table is iron. Up to there, the elements are produced by thermodynamically burning them, uh, thermodynamic cooking in the center of stars. So all of the heavier elements, uh, you know, you can't, you're, you're not gonna make them thermodynamically because you have to go past the most thermodynamically stable element iron. Uh, so instead, they, they're all made non-thermodynamically in uh, basically shocks. When, when the star goes through a period of r suddenly running out of fuel and before it ignites its next source of nuclear fuel, it, it explodes or, or, uh, and blows out a shock wave. Uh, and and in, that shock, in, in that shock, you can fuse other, you, you, that's where all these other guys, including uranium and thorium and plutonium and all the elements, yeah, that are, so, uh, so, uh, well, that's a long story. The bottom line is you start with hydrogen is what, is what we're going to say. And even if it's, even if it's the most, uh, thermodynamically stable, you know, you still need some, you, you still need to go through a lot of stages of stellar evolution to get to iron. Okay. Most stars just never make it there. I mean, most stars never, like our sun will never, uh, well, our, our, our stun, I don't know, I'm not a stellar physicist, so I don't, I don't exactly know, but you know, you need to be, uh, you know, roughly speaking, you, you, go through, you go through a first stage of burning where you burn hydrogen to helium. Uh, and then if you're massive enough, you go through another stage of burning where you, where if you, go, where you burn uh, helium to, uh, car, I guess, carbon, uh, or carbon, carbon and oxygen. And then if you're massive enough, you go through another stage of burning. And at each, at each stage, the fraction of, you know, the, the fraction of helium that you make in that process uh, uh, before, before, you can no long, before you can no longer support the uh, burning uh, is, 
you know, is small compared to the amount of hydrogen you started with, and then the amount of carbon is small relative to the amount of helium you started with. Just because, even though it's, even though in principle it's a lower energy configuration of those nucleons, there's still a big barrier, a huge Coulomb repulsion barrier to get over. Like four hydrogen nuclei don't want to be forced together into a helium atom, uh, and it's only if you can get them very close together that they suddenly realize that the strong force suddenly takes over and says, and says, oh, actually there is, there is a very deep valley here. Um, so that's why, you know, it's like, it's like putting four hydrogens together to make helium is a lower energy configuration of those atoms, but we still haven't successfully built a fusion reactor on, on Earth because it's so hard to, to cram these, to, 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 to maintain the cramming together of these nuclei. Uh, 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 enough for them to realize that that, 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 that that there's a thermodynamically preferable state available to them because uh, they're, they're so busy having instabilities induced by their electromagnetic repulsion, basically. Um, okay, yeah, so, so anyway, to make a long story short, the, 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 the heavier elements uh, are made in shock waves. Um, but so, 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 uh, uh, beta and gamma and these guys realized that you couldn't, you couldn't produce nearly, if the universe started with hydrogen, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't, by cooking it in stars, get anywhere near this amount of helium. The, the, this, as I was just saying, the, the, the process of, uh, of converting um, uh, hydrogen to helium, uh, you know, it really only works at the center of the star, and it, it, there's, no, there's no way you're ever going to get... Uh, uh, 25 percent of all of the hydrogen in the universe cooked into helium that way. So the question is what 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 is going on? And the back of the envelope calculation that Gamov does shows that uh, shows that not only can you do it in the Big Bang, but it's basically the expected thing. So so um, so with a small amount of fudging, I would now like to show you how you can get this this ratio 25 percent to 75 percent. Uh, with, with a couple lines uh, on the back of an envelope. Um, okay, so let's first maybe just to set the stage, review kind of the energy scales uh, uh, that, that we might that we might be thinking about. So at the, at the top of the scale, there's the Planck scale, ten to the nineteen GeV. Okay, the scale at which. Um, uh, naively, at least, one expects uh, quantum gravity effects to become important. Uh, and then, three orders of magnitude below that, there's the gut scale, 10 to the 16 GeV. Um, so that is, you know, if you run the three, if you use the renormalization group to run the three couplings of the standard model uh, up to high energies, they nearly cross at, at this energy scale, and there, and there are these famous grand unified theories that make use of that to embed the three gauge groups of the standard model into a single unified gauge group at that energy scale. So maybe that energy scale is important. We don't know yet. Uh, it turns out also that there are good reasons to think, although again, we don't know yet, that, that if inflation took place in the early universe, it took place uh, at around this scale. Um, so then we have to go down another 13 orders of magnitude to get to the scale currently being probed by the LHC. So that's sort of the typical collision energy, 10 to the 3, or it'll be getting up to 10 to the 4 almost. Um, uh, and then at 10 to the 2 GeV, that's, that's the basically electroweak scale. That's the mass of all of the heaviest particles in the standard model, the Higgs and the W and Z bosons and the top quark. Uh, another factor of, uh, so at 1 GeV, another, another factor of 100 below that are the, are the masses of the protons and neutrons that mostly matter to us at low energies that you and I are made of. Um, and then a very important energy scale below that is, is uh, ten, another factor of 1,000 below that is Uh, an MeV, which is where the electron is, the electron mass, and uh, 
And as will be important for us, an MeV is also basically the mass difference between the proton and neutron. They, are, they both have masses of, of a GeV, but their mass difference is uh, about, a thousand, about a thousandth of that. And And more generally, this is the energy scale for transitions between nuclei. So if you ask, you know, if you take, uh, if you take, if you manage to cram four hydrogen atoms together uh, until they want to form a helium nucleus, how much energy gets released? You know, what is the sort of binding energy? That's of order in MeV. And then we go down another five or six orders of magnitude to get to the binding energy of, of, of electron of, of uh, atoms. So 13.6 eV famously is the uh, Rydberg constant, the binding energy of hydrogen atoms. So in other words, how strongly are electrons bound to their nuclei? That's a very low energy. And then I guess another two or three orders of magnitude down from that is the neutrino mass. Okay? So uh, within that landscape, let's, let, it, let me suggest that, for, that we start uh, here at 10 to the 1 at 10 GeV. Okay, so imagine, imagine we start describing the universe at a, at when the temperature was uh, 10 GeV. Um, uh, so at that time, the particles that were present were basically the familiar particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, photons, positrons, the antiparticle, the, the electron, neutrinos, and they were, they were all relativistic because we're still, even the heaviest particles there, the, the proton and the neutron, were still a factor of 10 above their rest mass energy. So their, their kinetic energy is still dominating. They're still quite relativistic. So at that time, uh, what we learned from the, what we learned, we, we, we had this formula in the previous lecture for uh, relativistic species in thermal equilibrium, and what, what it, and the formula was that a relativistic species in thermal equilibrium has a number density that's some order one coefficient, uh, just a dimensionless number, times the temp times temperature cubed. Uh, so, in other words, all of these all of those species I just mentioned uh, uh, at that time have about the same have about the same number density. Their abundance is about the same. So there's there's, there's basically the same number of photons per unit volume as there are neutrons, as there are antineutrons, as there are protons, as there are antiprotons, as there are electrons, as there are positrons, uh, as there are neutrinos. Um, but now when we cool down by a factor of 10, uh, suddenly the proton, so when the temperature drops to 1 GeV, we see that suddenly uh, the protons and neutrons begin to become uh, non-relativistic. In other words, the temperature you can think of as always being the t typical kinetic energy of the particles uh, in, in thermal equilibrium. And so once we get down to the point where the, where the, where the kinetic energy is, the temperature is comparable to the rest mass, that, that's telling you that the particle is, is becoming non-relativistic and about to be very non-relativistic if, cool, if you cool much beyond that. Okay, so now we had, a, we had, this was our formula for the number density of a relativistic species, but remember our number density of the non-relativistic species has, it has a prefactor, which is in this particular situation not so crucial, but to get the dimensions right it has a prefactor, which is mass times temperature to the three halves, so that gives it the right dimensions, but then there's an exponential of minus the mass uh, over the temperature. And so this, this because of this uh, uh, exponential, as the temperature drops, this exponential is saying that as the temperature drops below the mass, uh, thermo, thermodynamic equilibrium wants to eliminate these non-relativistic particles like crazy. It wants to eat them all up and turn them into lighter species, which are thermodynamically preferable. Uh, so it wants to take all of these, if possible, it wants to take all of these protons and antiprotons and neutrons and antineutrons and convert them into photons or electrons or something more, something lighter so, and more relativistic, okay? Uh, so all the, 
all the protons and antiprotons annihilate, and all of the neutrons and antineutrons uh, annihilate. Well, except fortunately they don't all annihilate, uh, and uh, because then, you know, you know what I mean. If, if they all annihilated, that would be really bad. Fortunately, they don't all annihilate. It turns out, it, you know, it's, it, 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 instead what happened was that for every uh, billion antiprotons, there were a billion plus one protons. And uh, so the first billion protons were able to find a, an antiproton to annihilate with, but the billion and one uh, was not. And so at the end of the day, suddenly, after this annihilation takes place at one GeV, uh, we're left with a new picture of the universe where now the light guys, photons, electrons, positrons, and neutrinos, they all have the same number density as one another, but then there's just a smidgen of protons and neutrons left. There's about, there's about one proton left for every billion photons after that annihilation, okay? So that's an observed fact about the universe today, that there's one, that there's this number eta called the, called the baryon to photon ratio, and it is of order 10 to, it is measured to be, it's measured more accurately than this, but for our purposes at the moment, the only point is that it's about 10 to the minus nine. There's about 10 to the nine photons per baryon, per nucleon, neutron or proton. Okay, and uh, so, you know, why, why did this happen? Where did this number come from? Uh, in particular, if there had been an equal number of protons and antiprotons, then, uh, okay, they, it turns out they wouldn't have all annihilated because eventually they would get so sparse that they wouldn't be able to find one another to annihilate. Um, but they would have annihilated like crazy uh, to a number much below this. They would have annihilated, I, I forget. I, I, actually, I think I'll probably sketch the calculation during the lecture about this, but uh, I think they annihilate to, it's something absurdly small, some, 10 to the minus. We, 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 we would have observed 10 to the minus 40 or something like that, or we wouldn't have observed it because with 10 to the minus 40 protons, there's not much, you know, not enough to observe anything really. You can't, you can't, build, you can't build a PSI class to investigate these things. Um, okay, so yeah, so this, this is a famous problem. Uh, why was there this slight excess? Can we quantitatively explain this slight excess of matter over antimatter and explain why, there uh, therefore, why the universe today gets to have a leftover amount of antimatter, gets to have a leftover amount of matter to do something interesting with, but no, no uh, antimatter? Uh, and this is the problem of particle genesis or baryogenesis or leptogenesis. There's various uh, theories about what is up there, and we don't know what the answer is yet. Um, uh, so anyway, but as I say, that's, 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 for, that's, for, that's the topic of part of a lecture later this week. Uh, so I'll leave that there. What I, wanted to, what, what I want to now say is, so let's continue um, down, the, uh, down the energy scale. So at this point, the protons and neutrons have annihilated. Uh, they're non-relativistic. But their, their energy is still so high relative to the uh, binding energy of atomic nuclei that they haven't fused together yet to form atomic nuclei. They're just separate protons and, and neutrons, okay? Not, not bound into nuclei. Um, so they are going to bind into atomic nuclei at around this, once the temperature drops to this energy scale, the temperature of, of an MeV, a temperature of order, the, uh, new, the, 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 the energy differences between the, the binding energy of atomic nuclei. Uh, and so uh, that's what we want to sketch now. What, how many, um, uh, uh, when, when does that binding happen and, uh, and, and how many of each sort of nucleus will get created? So, uh, So let's first let's first sort of try to estimate um, uh, the uh, energy at which the temperature at which um, 
uh, at which the number of, of protons and, so let's, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? So the, the protons and neutrons and electrons and neutrinos are being held in thermal equilibrium. So, so the, 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 the remaining leftover protons and neutrons uh, are being held in thermal equilibrium with the thermal bath by a reaction Okay, pro proton plus electron fuses to give neutron uh, and electron neutrino. And there's all the different crossings you can get here. You can pull any particle across the arrow and turn it into its antiparticle. So for example, another reaction here would be uh, proton goes to neut neutron plus neutrino plus positron. Um, so, Remember, we, we want to, to determine, so this, this, is, this is holding, this, this reaction is holding uh, in the early universe, even after the, even after the protons and antiprotons annihilate, and the neutrons and antineutrons annihilate. So we're just left over with protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are still being held at their equilibrium abundances uh, uh, for a time. Uh, 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 until thermodynamics can no longer successfully keep them in equilibrium, until the expansion of the universe gets so fast relative to the reaction rates that are supposed to be responsible for maintaining approximate thermal equilibrium that the approximation of equilibrium no longer applies. Okay, so we want to estimate at what point does this pro do these processes become too inefficient to maintain the equilibrium abundances of the, of the protons and neutrons to, to maintain... Uh, these abundances. So, okay. So let's 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 just quickly estimate when that is. What temperature is that? So, so here's here's a here's our four fermion diagram. We have a proton uh, and an electron that come in and turn into a neutron and a neutrino. And this is the diagram as Fermi would have described it as the this was the effective Fermi's effective four fermion vertex that that as he would have described things back in uh, back at the time when Gamov was doing this calculation, he would have said, "Oh, there's a we don't really really understand how to do quantum field theory yet, but we can do things at tree level. And there, at tree level, there's a diagram that there turns out to be a vertex that I hypothesized, I being Fermi, where where this where four fermions can can couple together at a point, and the the vertex factor for that." Is the Fermi constant g sub f? Uh, now today, in the today we have the standard model resolves this diagram, and it says, you know, it it, it it gives us a more finely resolved picture of this this diagram. It says this proton is really three quarks. You know, the, the proton is an up quark, a down quark, and an up quark, and the neutron is an up quark, a down quark, and a down quark. And uh, when this when this up quark converts to a down quark, it emits uh, a W boson, which then gets absorbed by the incoming electron and turns it into a neutrino. Okay, and so in the standard model, we would estimate this diagram by saying, well, or we would calculate this di this diagram by saying, well, we have a vertex factor here and here. That's two two factors two factors of the SU2 gauge coupling. Uh, and then there's the propagator for this W boson. But we're talking about scattering at a temperature of, you know, we're, we're the, all, the whole story we're telling here is about how the universe behaved when the temperature was below 10, EV, 10 GeV, whereas the mass of this exchange particle is 100 GeV. So the the sort of typical momenta, which are, which we're talking about here, which are below 10 GeV, are so small relative to the mass of the 
w that's being exchanged, we can ignore it. Um, and so, so we see here that, 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 that what Fermi called the Fermi constant is nothing but, is nothing but, 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 but this constant that we get from taking, considering this diagram in the regime where the exchange momentum is very small relative to the mass of the exchange particle. And so just plugging in numbers here, so we basically have this Fermi constant here is about, well, the electroweak gauge coupling is about 0.3, so if we square that, we get a factor of 10 to the minus 1. And then m weak is about 100 GeV, so that gives us another factor of 1 over 100 GeV squared, or in other words, 10 to the minus 5 GeV squared. That's the Fermi constant. <coughs> okay, so we want to estimate the rate of this reaction, or this reaction. So, you know, to estimate the rate, we, well, we first have to calculate the diagram, right? That gives us the amplitude. So we just said that diagram has an amplitude of about g sub f. And then a rate is a probability. So we want to, it's quantum mechanics, we want to square that amplitude. <coughs> um, but this can't be the whole answer uh, because the units on this side are units of mass to the minus 4, whereas the units on this side, a rate, are 1 per unit time, or in other words, in, in, phys in high energy physicist units, mass. Uh, so in other words, there, this, this guy differs in units by five powers of mass relative to this guy. Uh, and uh, so now, in, 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 in quantum field theory, you would, you would calculate this, uh, you would calculate this, uh, there, you know, there's phase space integrals you have to do to integrate over all the possible end states and out states for this reaction. And those would give you the extra factors of uh, the exact numerical factors and the extra powers of mass. Um, but we are going to do things the quick and dirty cosmologist way if you just want to, usually in cosmology, if you're just trying to determine whether something, whether some process is, it's either plausible or it's just completely stupid. You shouldn't be considering it at all. And for that, you know, whether it's, whether you get a two or a pi in front is not the crucial thing. The crucial thing is are you anywhere in the ballpark? Are you, you know, within an order of magnitude or 30 orders of magnitude off? And for that purpose, we will do as Gamov would have done. And we would have just said, oh, all those phase space integrals, all the different momenta that are bumping around here are typically about the temperature of the process involved. And so, uh, you know, the phase space integrals will be dominated by those momenta. And at the end of the day, uh, the only dimension full quantity uh, relevant for setting the scales of those uh, 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 of those integrals is the temperature to the is the temperature. So we'll just add as many powers of temperature as we need to get the right dimensions on both sides. So that's five powers of temperature. Okay. So that's the rate, and now we're supposed to compare that. We said we said that when the rate for maintaining thermal equilibrium is much greater than the expansion rate of the universe, equilibrium will be established before the universe has had a chance to expand much. Uh, thermodynamics will be great. Uh, on, on the other hand, in the regime where the, where the, uh, where the, in the opposite regime, the universe will have expanded before the particles had a chance to, uh, to uh, react towards equilibrium, these, these, these equations will become totally irrelevant. Uh, so we want the transition. We want to find out when gamma is approximately equal to H. Um, but H, is given by the Friedman equation. So H is given by, we said it's 8 pi g Newton over 3 times the energy density of the universe, and then minus the, the, a term coming from the spatial curvature. Uh, well, it's an observed fact about the universe that this guy is negligible and was even more negligible at early times. So we'll ignore him. And so now, so we have, we have this equation, but we can rewrite rho, the energy density of the universe, uh, in terms of the temperature. We said that for each, uh, for each relativistic species, you know, we, 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 for each relativistic species, we can add, uh, each relativistic species contributes a factor of t to the fourth times some order one coefficient again, which is not crucial for this back of the envelope calculation. So you have t to the fourth 
for each species, you have to multiply that times the number of relativistic species that were around. So for example, you have the photon, it has its two polarizations. You have the neutrinos, there's three of them. They, they, uh, uh, you, uh, they, they, each of them has two degrees of freedom. Uh, you add those all up, there's an extra factor of about 10 for the number of degrees of freedom. I'll call that guy G star. Uh, so, and then there's the contribution from the non-relativistic species, the protons and the neutrons. Turns out to be negligible. Take my word for it. If you just plug in, if you just plug in the number density times the mass for the for the non-relativistic species, you'll see it's negligible relative to this. Uh, so anyway, so this is the this is the energy density we plug in here. So in, in other words, we've managed to rewrite H in terms of some constants: eight pi g newton over three, this constant ten, uh, and the temperature. Where we've, in other words, we've successfully rewritten. Uh, uh, H as some constant, which I won't write the exact constant on the board, um, times, okay, this was t to the fourth. We're going to take the square root of it to get H, so that's t squared. And then G Newton, let's work in high energy physicists units where when you, when you have H bar is equal to C is equal to 1, uh, G Newton is 1 over the Planck mass squared. So 1 over the Planck mass squared. Again, we're taking the square root. So this is t squared over the Planck mass. OK. Uh, so if we just set, so, so this is our estimate for gamma in terms of t. On the other hand, we have an estimate for h in terms of t, which is t squared over the Planck mass times some order one factor in front if you want to keep it. Uh, if you just solve for the temperature here, you find that it's 1 MeV. Okay, so that's the, that's the temperature at which you expect these. So thermodynamics was annihilating and annihilating and annihilating these, these, uh, uh, these guys uh, uh, as much as it could. And then suddenly at this moment, uh, it ceased to be effective at annihilating these guys. And so from that moment on, so suddenly after that moment, the number density of protons uh, at that moment was, you know, the, the, the mass of the proton times the times that transition temperature we just that 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 sort of critical temperature we just analyzed uh, over two pi to the three halves times exponential of the mass of the proton minus the mass of the proton over T star, uh, and a similar one for the number density of the neutrons. And then to a first approximation, after thermodynamics ceases to be effective in getting these guys to morph back and forth into, into different sorts of particles, they just hang around. The proton is stable, for, you know, as far as we can tell. The proton lives for longer than the current age of the universe, much longer. The neutron only lives for 15 minutes, but this was all taking place at a couple seconds or maybe a minute after the Big Bang. Uh, so as far as we are concerned, uh, on the time scales that are relevant for the calculation we're about to do, the neutron is also stable. So okay, so the ratio, according to this formula, the ratio of, of their um, of the, the number, of, the number of, of neutrons to the number of protons at that moment when thermodynamics, when, when the process, when thermodynamics froze out due to the Hubble expansion was the ratio of this factor to this factor. Now you see the prefactors will almost exactly cancel because the mass of the proton is almost exactly equal to the mass of the neutron. So those two factors cancel. The only important thing is the exponential here. And so we get that the exponent, we get, we get that the ratio is uh, to a good approximation given by the uh, minus the mass of the proton minus the mass of the neutron over, over the freeze out temperature. Um, and uh, so now if you just plug in, you know, the observed mass of the proton over the mass of the neutron, it is, uh, it's in my, I think it's maybe 1.3 MeV. Uh, and we just we just estimated that uh, T star was 
one MeV. Now it turns out if we just did that calculation a little bit, obviously I was very sloppy with that calculation. If you do that calculation a little bit more carefully, uh, you'll, I mean for back of the envelope purposes it's maybe not so crucial, but because I want to impress you by getting the actual right, right answer at the end of the day and you're not going to be as impressed if I miss by a whole factor of two, even though you should, that's the point. You should be, you should already be impressed even if I get the answer wrong by a factor of three or something. But I'm going to cheat a little bit and actually get the answer right. So, so part of that cheating is I'm going to modify the temperature slightly from uh, 1 MeV to 0.8 MeV, which is really the more correct answer. Okay, so if, yeah, if you, if you just plug that in, uh, exponential of minus 1.3 over 0.8 is about 1 sixth, okay? So that says that at the moment when thermodynamics quit, there were, there were about, uh, there was about one neutron for every proton. Um, and because, remember I mentioned that the protons are strictly stable, the neutrons are not quite stable, so they're actually gradually bleeding away. Uh, and so what happens here? We're, at, at the moment when thermodynamics quits, we have neutrons and protons in this ratio, and then they're going to wait a little bit longer until the temperature drops below the binding energy of uh, helium, and then as soon as that, as soon as that happens, it's going to become thermodynamically favorable for, for a helium nucleus to eat up all the neutrons, all the available neutrons and protons it can. Okay, so it turns out that because we have to wait, a little, wait around a little bit before this moment of, of uh, before this moment of freeze out and the moment when, 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 when the actual binding into, into helium takes place. During that time, the finite lifetime of, of, uh, of the neutron causes some of them to decay. So by the time the binding takes place, there's, there's, only, there's only one neutron per seven uh, protons. Um, Okay, and so, uh, so now let's just calculate the mass, the, 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 the ratio of mass. And, and if, all of those, if all of those neutrons get, if every one of those neutrons gets uh, e subsequently eaten up by a uh, helium atom, uh, then the total mass in helium will be, well, a helium is made of two neutrons and two protons. So the total number density of helium atoms, if every neutron gets eaten by a proton, then since the number of nuclei, in other words, since there's two neutrons in a, in a helium atom and four nucleons total, the number density, the, 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 the uh, mass density in uh, helium nuclei will simply be twice the mass density in neutrons. Okay, so it'll be the mass of a nucleon, so a mass of a proton or a neutron, uh, times two times the number density of neutrons. So that's the, that's going to be the mass density, that's the mass per unit volume, uh, in helium, and then we have to divide that by the total mass per unit volume, which is the number, which is the mass of, 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 of our nucleon, a proton or neutron, times the total number of nucleons available, n proton plus n, neut plus n neutron. Uh, and uh, so now if we just, okay, let, let, just to simplify things here, let's divide the top and bottom by the number of, by the number of neutrons. So we have, and by the, so we'll, we'll divide out this factor, and we'll divide by the number of neutrons on the top and bottom. So that becomes one, that becomes one, that becomes number of protons over number of neutrons, which is seven. So we have two divided by one plus seven, which is one quarter, which is the answer that we wanted to get. The, 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 the fact that 25% of the mass in the universe uh, is helium. Uh, we, we found that, uh, uh, you know, what Gamow really would have gotten by this same argument, he wouldn't have gotten the exact uh, answer right. As I say, I had to fudge a little bit and use some modern thinking to do so, but uh, he would have gotten by this line of argument that, that an order one fraction of the universe would be in helium, which they knew already at that time could not be achieved uh, 
in stars. And so it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, you know, decades ago, long before anyone else was thinking about it or thought it was the same thing to think about, uh, Gamow had the first bit of, uh, first, first good argument that, uh, that the Big Bang model really was correct, uh, even a few seconds uh, after the Big Bang. So it's, it's basically awesome. I hope, I hope you guys appreciate the depth of how awesome that is. Okay, so then uh, I wanted to then say, introduce you to, there's an analogous calculation you can do to check at what temperature the cosmic microwave background was formed. So again, there's, we just did this calculation where um, we calculated how many neutrons and protons were present, uh, and then, so we calculated what temperature at which they, at which their ratio of abundances sort of froze, and then a little bit later, we, we there's, there, there's a temperature at which it becomes thermodynamically favorable for them to bind together uh, into, into bound objects. And there's a similar transition that happens later, not, not for nuclei, but for atoms. So there's, there's, there's electrons floating around and protons floating around, uh, and they love to bind together to form uh, hydrogen atoms, you know, neutral hydrogen atoms. Uh, and then there's also the helium nuclei we just talked about with two protons uh, that would also like to bind together with two electrons. Um, but, uh, you know, when the universe is super hot, much hotter than the binding energy of those atoms, uh, it, it, the electrons all get stripped off of their nuclei, and instead it's just a, it's just a plasma of, uh, of charged electrons and, and protons. Uh, and so there is, there is quite an analogous, closely analogous calculation to the one I just did, to, to, this, to this calculation over here, that lets you estimate um, at what temperature this, it became favorable for the protons and electrons to bind up into uh, into atoms, neutral atoms. And as I mentioned the other day, you know, the, the story is that in the early universe, prior to that transition, when electrons and protons were separated from one another, uh, photons had lots of people to bump into. They, you know, photons love, photons like to bump into protons, but photons really love to bump into electrons. I mean, they, you know, a, a an electron is like a fine, it's wine or something to a photon. It's like, ah, I could, I could, I could bump into Z's all day, you know? Um, anyway, so, so in the early universe, they, they're just bumping like crazy. They really can't control themselves. They're staggering around through the early universe. They're, their mean free path between bumps is, uh, is ultra tiny relative to the, uh, relative to the uh, sort of typical size of the universe at that time, which, which is one, which is basically, so, one, so H has units of length, has, has units of one over time. So one over H has units of time. And so speed of light times H has units of length. That's sort of a typical, that's sort of the, the so-called Hubble radius, the characteristic length scale associated with the expansion of the universe. At any given moment in time, these guys were had mean free paths that were ultra tiny relative to that. They essentially went nowhere. Uh, then suddenly, more or less, uh, at a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, these guys formed into hydrogen atoms. Uh, these guys had no one else to bump into. And so after, after a good, you know, those were good times. There was a lot of good bumping. But suddenly, at that moment, uh, there was no one else to bump into. And 90% of photons have subsequently just moved along uh, geodesic with no further uh, scatterings since then to, until the present day. 10% um, of lucky photons have found someone to scatter off of, but, uh, but most of them have not. Um, and so, you know, you, you, can, you can estimate what is the temperature at which this transition took place. And so that tells you what, what, were, the, uh, what were the wavelengths of these photons at that time. And then they stream through the universe, and you predict there should be some bath of these photons filling the universe today, the 90% of photons that never scattered again. Uh, and now you go out and measure their temperature today, and you find it's three degrees above absolute zero. 
So they're, micro, they're microwave photons. Uh, the, the calculation that you will do uh, says that they were about 3,300 degrees Kelvin at the time that this transition took place. Um, so in other words, the universe was smaller by a factor of about uh, 1,000. The scale factor was smaller by a factor of 1,000 at that time. Um, but modulo that change, these, these photons today still carry a sort of pristine snapshot of the, of the universe at that moment in time. And so I just wanted to uh, quickly show in the last five minutes uh, the key sort of figures. At this point, you can't talk about the cosmic microwave background without showing three basic pictures. Um, uh, It's up there. Okay, so man gets on the train, sits down. There is a. Uh, uh, yeah, what's when there's when there's only five minutes left in the class? What is 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 a joke even merited? Probably yes. Uh, so I had meant to tell again two jokes today, but okay. No one reminds me. What, why could that be? Why could that possibly be that you guys don't remind me? Must just be forgetfulness on your part as well. Um, so your man gets on a train, uh, uh, sits down across from another man in a finely tailored suit with a briefcase. Uh, they. They sit more or less after a little bit of chit chat. The, the, you know, he talks to the man. The man is a biz businessman heading to uh, Leningrad on business. And uh, uh, anyway, they both they both uh, settle down and are quiet after a while. And it gets gets into evening. And uh, suddenly, there's a screech. The brakes slam on. The lights go out in the train. Uh, everyone is upset. The man flips open his briefcase and says, pulls out a banana, says, don't worry, I'm actually a secret police. He pulls out a banana, holds it like a gun. Um, okay, well, I I would, that's, uh, that's easily the worst response. <laughs> to any of my jokes so far, but uh, it didn't, I don't feel that one deserved a worse response than yesterday's, which I think also deserved a bad response, but um, anyway, it's hard to predict with these things. Okay, so what do we have here? So here, in, 19, in the early 1990s, uh, a satellite called the FIRAS satellite, or the FIRAS instrument on the COBE satellite, uh, so this is a microwave satellite. You went up into orbit, uh, so so it could be above the atmosphere, which obscures most of the microwaves, uh, uh, which would otherwise obscure the microwaves. So uh, you go up uh, into orbit, and uh, the first thing we're doing here is just counting the number of photons or the intensity of the radiation uh, coming from an arbitrary point on the sky. Uh, doesn't matter where you point. You just point anywhere at those frequencies uh, and count in, in each frequency bin, uh, measure the amount of uh, intensity you get. Uh, and so the, the, the perfect predicted, theoretically predicted black body curve, the Planck spectrum, uh, is, is plotted there in, uh, uh, in green. And, uh, and then those, those red things are the observed data points with the error bars blown up uh, by a factor of 1,000 to make them visible. So in other words, the real data uh, fits the perfect black body curve uh, so well that you can't, can't by eye see the error bars unless they, unless they blow them up. So the, the cosmic microwave background is observed to have a perfectly black body spectrum, 
uh, which which is interpreted to mean that the that it that it was emitted by a plasma that was in essentially perfect thermal equilibrium at the time that it that this transition took place. Yeah. What foregrounds did you calculate? You know, you don't have to do anything for to, to get just the to just get the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. It dominates at those frequencies. You don't point at the sun. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You point away from the sun. Yeah. But that's that's that really is all. That really is essentially all you need to do. Um, because the, it's the dominant source of radiation at a, at a, gen, at a generic point in the sky at those frequencies. Um, okay, so here, so now, now it turns out that if you have a telescope that points accurately, and you point it in this direction, and you measure a spectrum, it's a perfect black body spectrum. Okay, so you, you, you point somewhere, hold your telescope in that direction and on the sky, and measure the spectrum, and you get a perfect black body. Uh, and now you point at a slightly different direction on the sky and measure the spectrum again. You again get a perfect black body, uh, but with a slightly lower uh, a black body corresponding to a thermal system at a slightly lower temperature. So wherever you point on the sky, the spectrum is pristinely thermal, uh, but the temperature of that thermal distribution uh, is different from from in different directions on the sky, and the fluctuations are tiny. Okay, so the so the the the, the mean uh, temperature uh, over the whole sky is I, I I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it's like 2.7. It's known to five decimal places, but it's three eight. I'm making up these numbers. Okay, so so there's a there's a mean there's a mean value, and then as you look from point to point on the sky. Different points fluctuate uh, in the fourth or fifth decimal place. Okay, so so the fluctuations are are at the level of ten to the minus five, um, and so that's what's being plotted here. So the red regions, the the, the 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 mean value has been subtracted out, and what we're looking at is a map of the tiny fluctuations from point to point on the sky, uh, where the red spots are a little bit hotter by about ten to the minus five than the, than the mean, and the blue spots are a little bit colder. Uh, Um, yeah, let's see. Did uh, you know? And so, the maybe the final thing to say. You know, well, the really also I should mention. So there's been this march forward. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh much bigger, much bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think there, well, well, the best experiment was this FIRAS experiment, and I think it, its experimental uncertainty was not good enough to detect the variations from thermal equilibrium. Uh, it's very accurately thermal. There is one thing, if you happen to look on the sky towards a cluster of galaxies, there's this effect called the Sinyaev Zeldovich effect, which even though the, even though this, the cosmic microwave background was, is intrinsically so thermal that you can't detect the deviation, as it passes through the cluster of galaxies, the electrons tend to preferentially upscatter photons and drive them out of thermal equilibrium. So if you look towards clusters, we now it's now turned into a very important new bit of cosmic information about the structure of the universe that you see these slight deviations from thermal equilibrium. But that's that's really about the clusters. That's not really about the CMB. Um, you know, you can get this on a beach ball. That's always something to go for. They, they, there's been this succession of better and better cosmic microwave background experiments. So in, in about 2003, there was the WMAP experiment, which made a really great, it didn't have this high resolution, but it made the, the previous, you know, 10 year ago version of this. And you could get the map on a beach ball. Those are awesome. And so now it's, those are, you know, all, you can't get those anymore. But Planck just came out. You can still get a Planck beach ball. You'd be crazy not to get a Planck beach ball. I mean, come on. Um, and finally, so, this is the this is the famous power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. So, uh, what's going on here? So, we take so this is a map of the temperature as a function of the angles as the function of the angle on the sky. So let's put spherical coordinates on the sky, and so what we've measured there is a, is, is the temperature on the sky as a function of uh, the spherical angles theta and phi. Uh, 
So that's some function on, on the two-sphere. Now any function on the two-sphere, just like, just, like just like you would take a function in Euclidean space and decompose it, you know, it naturally decomposes into Fourier modes. So a function on the two-sphere, uh, you know, the, the, the appropriate harmonic de decomposition, the, the, the solutions of the, of the wave operator are not flat space Fourier modes, they're, they're spherical harmonics. Um, and you can decompose, you know, spherical harmonics are just a set of uh, natural functions on which, a complete, a complete and orthogonal set of natural functions on which you can decompose any, any function on the sphere. Uh, you're probably familiar with them from, they're, they're the ang they describe the angular distribution in the uh, solutions of the hydrogen atom, like the, the electrons. There's the, the electronic wave function has a radial part times the angular part, and the angular part is the spherical harmonic. Okay, so, so spherical harmonics come in, there are an infinite number of them, uh, and they're labeled by, you probably remember this, labeled by two integers m and l. Uh, so these are functions on the sphere labeled by these two integers m and l. Or remember l is basically like the, l tells you basically how fast the function oscillates on the sphere. It, rough, it oscillates roughly l times between maxima and minimum uh, as you go 360 degrees around the sphere. Um, and m just tells you how that oscillating function is oriented on the sphere. So for every given l, for every given uh, number of oscillations, uh, uh, sort of for every given uh, size of oscillations, there are two L plus one different spherical harmonics with different orientations labeled by this, labeled by their uh, magnetic quantum number M. Anyway, so, so we, we, we take this guy and we decompose it in spherical harmonics and the coefficients in that decomposition, the so-called ALMs, uh, uh, these are just numbers that multiply multiply these guys, and depending on what these numbers are, by, by changing these numbers, you can you can you can you can reproduce any arbitrary function on the sphere. Okay, so what we do, we, we make that map, we decompose it in this way, and so what we've really measured in that map are ALMs, or all the different ALMs corresponding to our observed CMB sky, and then. The, the statistics of those ALMs are consistent with them being drawn from a random distribution of the following form. There's, there's some constant that depends only on L, and then the different ALMs are otherwise uh, uncorrelated with one another. Um, Okay, so every, so every ALM in the CMB appears to have been drawn independently, uh, and, uh, but, but, but all, of the, all of the ALMs at a given value of M, all 2L plus 1 ALMs at a given value of, sorry, L, I should have said, so at a fixed L, all the different 2L plus 1 ALMs, are drawn from the same, are independently drawn from the same distribution whose variance is C sub L. So we can, we can then use the 2L plus 1 ALMs that we measure at a given L to estimate the variance of the distribution that they were drawn from. We can estimate this number CL. We just, uh, we just estimate it by taking by summing the squares of all of our ALMs, as you would imagine estimating the variance. You, you sum from, at a fixed L, from, from minus L to L, the absolute value squared of the ALMs, and you, you average it to get the estimated variance. Okay, so you go out, you make your map, you measure the ALMs, at a fixed L, you average all 2L plus one of them to get a measured value for C sub L. At each L you do that, and now you plot the number C sub L as a function of L, okay? And that is what is shown on the next figure here. <laughs> 
Uh, so here, that's exactly what the, what's exactly what the Planck team has done here with their data. Uh, exactly is overstating things. That is a pro that is very close to what the Planck team has done here with their data. Um, and uh, so you see the you see the error bars, uh, and then there's a theoretical curve underneath that that we haven't explained yet. But that's in short, that is our that is our most powerful probe of the early universe. We have this the, 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 this beautiful power spectrum. Uh, of the cosmic microwave background. This is, this is the amplitude of CL plotted as a function of L. Oh, man. I took a figure that didn't label it in terms of L. Oh, good. That's wonderful. OK, so as a function of L. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so in, 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 the, in, the, in the last week of the course, one of the things we want to understand is where does that curve come from? What does it tell us about the, uh, so that's, that's, that, that in some sense is a snapshot of the spectrum of fluctuations a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, but, uh, but it tells you something uh, much uh, cleaner, if you want, much, much neater about the spectrum of fluctuations, you know, really mi micro, uh, a small, tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang uh, at the start of the radiation era. And we want to understand that and sort of learn the leading thought about where it came from. Anyway, sorry, I totally ran over. Uh, I apologize about that. Um, that, that's it. Sorry, no, no, yeah, yeah, sorry, go, go, go. 